Well, hello everyone and welcome to Display Week 2020. My name is Brian Berkeley. As a past president of SID on behalf of both SID 2020 and Nanasys, this week I'm your host for interactive discussions as we have conversations with key display industry leaders and influencers. Today's guest is Max McDaniel, who is Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer of Applied Materials Display and Flexible Technology Group. Max has held engineering, marketing, and financial management roles in high-tech equipment companies for over 25 years. Uh, he has been at Applied Materials since 2003. Prior to joining Applied Materials, Max served over 12 years at Watkins Johnson, a semiconductor and LCD equipment manufacturer, where he worked in R&D, engineering, and marketing roles. Max, thanks so much for joining us and welcome to the show. Well, uh, thank you, Brian, and thanks to Nanosys and SID for giving me this opportunity to exchange views on the industry. Um, it's great to have you here. And I guess the first thing that I have to ask you about is how you and your family are doing through the health crisis. Well, uh, my family uh, and I are healthy and doing well. Some disruptions for sure, but I consider our situation to be very fortunate compared to the impact that some others are suffering. The things that I do miss, uh, if I look back to pre-COVID days, are coming into work, uh, the camaraderie of working with my colleagues, uh, travel, both uh, personal and business travel, uh, traveling to see customers. But, you know, if those are my biggest concerns, I think I should count my blessings. Uh, I wish you and the viewers of this podcast health and safety as we continue to deal with this epidemic. Thank you. Um, how has COVID-19 uh, affected applied materials and your work and, and the overall display market? Well, uh, I guess, let me start by saying that we're uh, just closing our quarter and we're going to be having our earnings call in the next couple of weeks. So I won't be too specific about the immediate business, but I can say, first of all, we're, prioritize, we're prioritizing safety uh, of our employees and our customers globally, and we're making great use of the wonderful communications technologies that are available now for businesses to continue smoothly and safely. Uh, we're also fortunate to have a significant uh, customer support and technical support infrastructure in all the countries where our customers operate. Uh, so it, it enables us to continue to support our customers. For my own work, uh, it's almost entirely uh, work from home these days. We have internal meetings that I think are nearly as efficient as they were face-to-face. -face. That actually surprises me. Uh, we engage with customers now by video meetings uh, of course, we even have presentations and uh, discussions like the one we're having today seamlessly by video. I uh, actually have more productive hours per day than I did before because this 90-minute uh, commute that I used to have in Bay Area traffic uh, gives me an hour and a half uh, extra time per day. A little bit of that I apply to work, and a lot of it I apply to getting more sleep. I, I think all of us are getting used to barking dogs and, and uh, unhappy kids in the background, but uh, I don't miss the traffic either. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I do want to ask uh, some questions about technology. Um, and, and Applied Materials is so deeply into all kinds of production technology for displays. So in uh, the rest of this year and into 2021, I'm wondering what display technology you see is having the biggest opportunity for CapEx investment and overall production growth? Well, uh, CapEx investment uh, these days, the past couple of years and, and uh, currently, it's driven primarily by OLED and smartphones. So uh, all of the fabs for smartphones going in now are OLED uh, technology. And then uh, in TVs, it's still LCD, but now it's LCD on uh, bigger and bigger fabs, uh, even of course, gen generation 10.5 fabs uh, for LCD TVs where the glass is as big as garage doors that's going through uh, all of the fab and all of our equipment. Uh, there is an emerging OLED TV uh, investment happening as well. This is still just, I would say, emerging, and, uh, but it's going to grow more prominent over the next few years. And I guess I should say it is uh, not just OLED TV, but there, are, there will be different variations on it, including things like QD OLED TV. Okay. Besides TV and, and mobile, 
Do you see other areas with growth potential? For example, a lot of people have been talking about automotive applications or maybe other areas? Well, uh, automobiles uh, uh, displays are very exciting. Um, I think uh, um, the fact that you've got, you know, whatever, 200 million cars out there and we're getting more and more displays uh, per car. I think it's also exciting because the displays aren't just going to digital displays, but because the inside of a car is the curvy form factor, curved form factor displays are also going to be in demand. So over time, I guess this is the theme that I'm going to keep bringing up, is we could see OLED adoption in automobiles as well, which would be exciting for us. Uh, but in the meantime, a growing LCD presence in cars is going to be there. So one other uh, interesting area besides uh, uh, besides TVs and mobile and automobiles is the, the IT displays. So these are laptop computers, monitors, and uh, 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 tablets. And these are these are displays that I think uh, in the past, maybe the past 10 years or more, have been mostly like leftover LCD TV capacity that was being used to manufacture them. But we're now starting to see pull by the brands to adopt OLED into IT devices as well. Now that's exciting because if you're going to make OLED IT, you've got to build brand new fabs. There's going to be probably even different flavors of the manufacturing technology that are optimized for IT manufacturing. So this is a whole other wave of investment that we could start seeing over the next few years. Well, that's exciting. Um, so that makes me think about backplanes. And I'm wondering, you know, LTPS, uh, IGZO, LTPO, kind of hybrid between LTPS and, and oxide. Um, and others, can you share any insight on the directions that those will take? Sure. So you're right about that. There's a lot happening in back planes. Uh, somehow a lot of the focus is on what's going on in the front planes, uh, like the front plane of OLED. But, but there's always an advanced back plane that's coming with these new technologies. So, you know, we can maybe, again, look at TV and, and uh, 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 mobile and others separately. Uh, in TVs, amorphous silicon still dominates the backplane, but oxide TFTs or IGZO, IGZO are emerging both for OLED TV and also uh, some schemes for making 8K TVs require, require uh, a more advanced TFT backplane as well. Um, and then in mobile, the backplanes several years ago shifted from amorphous silicon to LTPS just for high resolution uh, LCD. So when the LCD resolution got above about 300 PPI, there was a transition from amorphous to LTPS. And then certainly uh, OLED smartphones require an LTPS backplane as well. This is exciting for us and I think for the industry because you know it's in backplanes, it's all of these advanced technologies that we're talking about you're going to more complex devices, complex devices with more deposition layers, more process layers. And that's certainly true when you go from amorphous silicon to these various uh, uh, advanced backplanes. And then as you said, uh, beyond uh, LTPS, you've got uh, LTPS and oxide hybrids like LTPO that can enable the benefits, kind of the best of both worlds. You can build, uh, driver devices uh, on, on them using the uh, LTPS uh, parts of the backplane, and you can get power savings with low uh, leakage current from the metal oxide and longer battery life. So uh, lots of interesting innovations and technologies are happening in backplanes, and it's all about more complexity and more opportunity actually for the equipment makers. Yeah, and I, I don't think we want to get too techy here, but it's, it's hard not to. You think about these new devices, uh, they're, they have to drive higher current levels, they need higher mobility, they need uh, lower threshold voltage variation, you therefore need better insulators. Uh, and uh, Applied being a leader in the backplane area and, and fab area, that's, uh, I know you guys are working hard on it, and, and especially to be able to do all that and then to save power, as in the LTPO example, um, that's, uh, that's exciting. Um, you know, one more one more thing. If I, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, another thing that's happening is you're seeing uh, semiconductor technologies that were uh, adopted by the semiconductor industry 20, 30 years ago 
uh, are just now coming into play in the uh, in the display industry. So, you know, uh, process technologies like atomic layer deposition and you know high K materials. So, a lot of these things we're able to borrow from the uh, semiconductor industry to drive the display industry roadmap forward. Yeah, but to scale up on a large substrate. Uh, uh, oh yeah, plenty of, it's a, plenty yeah. of challenges, <laughs> but plenty of payoff too. Um, there is, there is. So we can borrow what we learned before, but there's certainly innovation that's needed to adapt it for the display industry. So Max, you had talked a little bit about conformable displays. Um, and of course, that makes me think about the importance of uh, flexible displays. And um, I'm wondering what applications you think will benefit the most from flexible technology. Um, you know, you start with phones. I mean, uh, having a uh, either a you know full sized six inch phone that can fold up like a clamshell and fit into your pocket more easily uh, that's a great benefit and then uh, you know or having a full sized uh, phone when it's folded that unfolds into a, a tablet size um, it, you know this is so it's it's very well suited to the the smartphone but then if you think about uh, uh, notebooks I mean having a a notebook where maybe part of the display can be a keyboard sometimes, but you can also open it up and have it into just a kind of a, you know, massive, I don't know, 30 something inch display that you can use to, to watch movies on. So, and they're just, they're going to look nicer uh, for TVs. Uh, I don't know about a foldable TV, but if you want to imagine uh, the world where you have a 200 inch TV that completely covers your wall, uh, I think that's, you know, almost every vision of the future household has something like that. Well, you're going to need it to be a very light, very, very thin TV uh, to go onto your wall like wallpaper. And for that matter, you want to, maybe you want it to roll up like carpeting just so you can get it through the front door. <laughs> so, so um, <laughs> it's, it, there's so many applications when you start, you know, we, we used to think flat panel display was the, the like the modern display well, we're going to go away from flat displays to a much more diverse uh, form factor displays. Um, I've got a tough question for you. Um, it, it can also be useful to talk about disappointments, uh, to learn from those experiences. And I'm wondering if you could name a display technology that Applied was ready to support with technology and equipment, but it just didn't take off. And uh, maybe what happened? Sure. Uh, by the way, that's that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> let I me ask it. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Uh, if you don't mind, let me go back a few years. So uh, we will talk about this, but don't let me not talk about something too recent. Uh, but uh, if we look about a decade ago, uh, we had applied. We developed a technology that was related to the inkjet printing of color filters. Okay, so this was. Uh, Many people in the industry, including panel makers, they thought that inkjetting of RGB, rather than doing it with a litho process, you could replace the incumbent approach and do it for a significantly lower cost. So without getting into the details of our technology, we made quite a lot of progress uh, uh, on this. And ultimately the inkjet compatible inks were not the same quality as the litho based inks. The color quality wasn't as good. There's a higher occurrence of point defects because of the wetting properties of the inks uh, and how they mix with the black matrix material. So the potential cost savings was not worth the sacrifice in color quality and the difference in yield. So the point is, regardless of how good our equipment technology might have been, the technology wasn't adopted widely in the industry. So one of the key lessons that we learned and something that I took to heart is you know, if you're, let's say, an equipment maker, no matter how much you do, if you're going after technology where you're relying on big breakthroughs by somebody else, like the material makers in this case, then that's a risk factor that you've got to recognize. Well, um, I appreciate your sharing that with us, and I don't mean to grind in the pain, but actually, if we turn the hands of time forward and talk about today, there is quite a bit of buzz about inkjet printing. And I'm wondering if Applied uh, might be offering any equipment in this area. Well, uh, it, we haven't announced the product uh, in this area. And so I, I can't comment on anything that uh, we haven't announced. I can't comment one way or the other on this one. But 
let me just say related to the products that we have announced, uh, if inkjet printing or any other uh, RGB OLED printing technology for TVs is successful and it lowers the cost of OLED TV manufacturing and if it accelerates the adoption, this is going to be manufactured on an oxide backplane. This is an incredible business for us. It's already a great uh, business. So we welcome any kind of a technology like that. Now, if we have a chance to help to enable it on the front plane as well, um, that's an opportunity that uh, certainly could be exciting for us. Uh, regarding the inkjet uh, or solution-based uh, OLED deposition, it is a big challenge for from a materials and a device standpoint. Uh, it's extremely hard to deposit multiple soluble layers that behave well as they dry without interacting with each other. Uh, the materials themselves, uh, they don't perform and provide the same lifetime as the incumbent evaporated materials, at least so far. So regarding what we're doing in this area, I can't really comment, but adoption of whatever OLED TV technology succeeds is going to be very good for us. It is, it is kind of a holy grail. And, and the tough thing, as you say, is achieving simultaneously the efficiency and the life and the gamut characteristics. Um, uh, but, you know, this is what makes the display industry so interesting is that you can watch all these developments and come to SID every year and, um, and, and see new things and learn about the developments. Um, I've, I've got to ask you uh, your perspectives on, on the display industry. You guys have such great visibility. And I'm wondering what you think is the biggest challenge facing the display industry and and, you know, in particular, the equipment sector. So I think for the display industry overall, I mean, the, the, the commoditization, commoditization is the thing that we have to worry the most about. So the, what's happened in the past and what I think is going to keep happening in the future is the industry is going to keep uh, reinventing itself. A new, better display technology will come along uh, Consumers will value it. They'll want that one. It will obsolete the old one. And then there'll be a whole new wave of adopting the new technology, building new fabs in order to uh, create it. So that's what I expect to happen. So the, the risk or the, 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 the biggest downside scenario is that that innovation doesn't happen fast enough or the innovation doesn't happen at the correct price points so that the real adoption doesn't happen. And then what you'll end up with eventually is you would have a commoditization of the current technology. If next year's TV isn't significantly better than this year's TV, uh, there's not going to be a lot of profit in it. There's not going to be a lot of demand for it. And it's going to become a commoditized industry. Let me repeat, I don't think that's going to happen. The whole industry is working toward uh, uh, adopting and enabling these new display technologies. Consumers are hungry for new displays. People are visual. They love new visual experiences. So, again, I don't think that's going to happen, but that's the biggest downside scenario. Um, Max, you talked about uh, a lot about OLED uh, a moment ago. I'm, I'm wondering specifically from a manufacturing and equipment point of view, what you think is the most interesting thing about OLED technologies? Well, uh, Maybe I've talked enough about the backplane, but uh, I always want to remind people what, how exciting the, the OLED backplane is. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, it's already a, an interesting challenge on, on the mobile side where currently on the front plane, because OLED is such a fragile material and you can't expose it to air, oxygen or, or moisture any time during the manufacturing process, you end up doing... Every step, maybe you know, 20 or 30 layers uh, on the OLED front plane, all in the same vacuum system or different chambers, but you've got to keep it in, under vacuum. Those systems are the size of a, of a football field. And you, know, you can't have any defects. So it's a managing yield as you go through all of these steps. Um, it's a very, very tricky business. And at the end, you have to perfectly encapsulate it so that when you do take it out of vacuum, you don't uh, end up uh, um, uh, you know, poisoning the device. So it's such a tricky, finicky material. And then already we're moving, we're moving the next step, which is how do you make the thing flexible and foldable? Uh, it's, it, it's so exciting. And every one of these steps, new process uh, uh, steps are needed to, in order to make it work. And it's just, it's fun to be right at the forefront of helping to enable those things. 
I have probably 100 questions, and we don't have time for them. But sometime offline, I'd like to ask you about laser liftoff and, and, and others. Um, but I'll it's switch offline. Gears. Okay. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a huge challenge. Uh, your perspectives on micro LEDs, what do you think about the opportunities there? And uh, what areas like deposition or transfer or test and, and so on will applied equipment play a role in the making of micro LEDs? Sure. Uh, I'm going to beat the drum one more time. Uh, the backplane opportunity is going to be great because micro LEDs, even more than OLEDs, you, you're going to need a uh, you're going to need a, a backplane that really, really controls the current uh, 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 very precisely and uh, and uniformly. So that's one opportunity. But uh, I apologize. I keep saying it, but I think I'm going to keep saying it uh, throughout this uh, this interview. But uh, on the front plane, you know, uh, I guess I should start out by saying applied materials is uniquely positioned because we're the largest semiconductor uh, equipment company, and then we're also uh, uh, the leading uh, display company. So micro LED does uh, involve combining uh, uh, capabilities from both of these areas. So potentially micro LEDs are gonna be better than any display technology in the market today. They're bright, they're durable, they're low power, great contrast ratio, uh, potentially flexible and curved, overall fantastic technology. Uh, the problems are yield and cost, okay? From a cost uh, manufacturability standpoint, we still have a long way to go for mass adoption. So the high cost is due to a number of things, but just, just for one, if you think of a, of a 4K TV with 25 million subpixels, or an AK TV with 100 million subpixels. Just the just the area of the uh, just the area of the micro LED substrate itself. You can't make them small enough not to be using up a big area of these micro LED expensive wafers. And so already you need a one or two order of magnitude cost reduction just in the sort of the pixelation of these raw uh, micro LED wafers. So we have a very long way to go uh, in cost manufacturability, the pick and place, how do you control yield? Uh, how do you bin them? How do you get uniform brightness? There are lots and lots of challenges. So it's almost like the ultimate display, but it's going to take several more years of innovation. And I think there are a lot of areas in there where applied can bring our technology to bear. So let me ask you this. You're the chief marketing officer of applied. What's the most exciting group? I'm the, the display, display group, group of yeah. Applied, but what, what, is, what is the most exciting thing that's going on at Applied Displays at this time? You know, I, I think, um, you know, one nice thing about being in our position, which with, with such a wide scope of, of, of capabilities and technologies is a lot of, of uh, industry players, whether it's panel makers or the panel makers customers or our peers or startup companies, um, they engage with us. So we're in the conversations talking with lots of different uh, people in the industry about what they're working on, lots of collaborations. So I just think we're in a just exciting uh, position to have plenty of information about the road, what the roadmap looks like, what the requirements are, and then having all of these capabilities that we can bring to bear to help bring the new technologies into reality. And, and, and as I think about that, um, I know there has been a lot of consolidation in both of the semiconductor and, and display equipment sectors over many years. Um, and I'm wondering, do you think there's still opportunities for new companies to emerge and compete in this space? Well, you know, in one sense, uh, if you want to be, uh, if you want to produce panels or if you want to produce uh, equipment, uh, there's a lot of infrastructure you need to do this well uh, for the kind of mass produced panels. Okay. But on the other hand, you know, new technologies can come in and wipe out the incumbent technology. So new tech, new companies who innovate in areas in these areas, they really can succeed. So even small innovative companies, they can grow to a point where they have something unique and special. You know, it may be though that their path is to be acquired by a larger company so that you can combine the, the kind of new innovative technology with the infrastructure required to implement it. So um, I think there's still opportunity, especially for startup companies, uh, 
to uh, come into play. But it's probably, you know, it's hard for kind of a medium sized company to come in and compete in the incumbent technologies. In fact, I would say almost impossible. In those areas, you'll see more consolidation than you will see diversification. Along those lines, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing the display industry today? Uh, well, uh, I mean, getting back maybe to what I said before about the commoditization would be uh, my biggest fear. Um, but, you know, as far as challenge, kind of positive challenges are just these these exciting technology challenges that uh, we're going to work together and, and we're going to solve them. And maybe I, I can add one more sort of challenge or sub challenge to that is you can't just solve the uh, technology uh, problem or make the technology work. There are certain price points at the uh, consumer uh, in the different consumer segments, and you've got to hit those price points. So no matter how good your TV technology is, you can't uh, sell lots of $10,000 TVs. So there has to be at least a roadmap, a path to get that new technology down to these rather fixed mainstream consumer price points. And I, I must say we're seeing that with quantum dots right now as they move into the mainstream of, of the display marketplace, certainly within TV. Um, I'm going to ask you a final question uh, since this is part of SID. And that is just I want to ask you, Max, how SID could, as an industry-supporting organization, uh, help your business. Sure. Um, I think, you know, as maybe as big as we are uh, in the industry, there are areas where, um, you know, the industry can benefit, could get benefits, but there's no one company that can do this thing, do this alone. And I think, you know, areas, I mean, SID already provides a lot of benefits, things like providing opportunities for information exchange and collaboration. I think the um, Display Week uh, uh, is a great example of how SID already does that. I think uh, providing opportunities for universities and startup companies to present new ideas to the industry, that's a great uh, purpose uh, served by SID. Uh, advocating a robust uh, education at the universities around the world in display specific uh, areas. And then maybe one other area I can think of is applied is also, we're starting to focus more on how to make our technologies eco-friendly. And so perhaps this could be a general focus of, uh, of SID to coordinate and promote is how we as an industry can make our industry uh, more eco-friendly. This is certainly becoming more and more important in the world. And I think that that's something that uh, SID could help us with. Well, I know that uh, SID leadership is going to be watching our interview, and so you can consider that feedback right. given to them now. Um, Max, I want to thank you so much for being part of the show uh, this week, and uh, it's great to reconnect with you and um, look forward to more conversations with you in the future. Thank you so much for being part of our show. Thank you, Ryan. It was great. It was a lot of fun.